welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm driving something really quite significant and really unusual as well because in this job I get to see an awful lot of cars but today I'm driving a car that not only have I never driven before I've never even seen in real life yes this is a Hyundai S Coupe the scoop have you ever seen one of these? I really genuinely haven't, so I'm very excited. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rotem in Kent. So check out the link in the description below. And also, if you like reviews of unusual, different, un weird cars you've never seen before, then make sure you hit like and most definitely subscribe and hit that bell notification. Now, word from our sponsors and on with the review. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Now the S-Coupe was a very significant car for Hyundai and the Korean motor industry in general. It was their first two-door coupe, their first sports car, and in fact from midway through its life, the first ever homegrown, in-house developed engine as well, which we are currently driving behind right now. Now the name though is quite an interesting one. We we call it the S Coupe here in the UK, I believe in America and the rest of Europe. We call it the same thing as well. However, in its home market of Korea, it was called the Scoop, which is a portmanteau of the words sporty and coupe. And as you know, portmanteau is my favorite word and one of my favorite things. So any car with its name being a portmanteau is automatically gonna be one of my favorite cars for that alone. However, it didn't start off with such a poetic beginning. This began in the mid-1980s under a project to create the first ever homegrown two-door coupe, a car that was desirable to own, that they wanted people to enjoy looking at. And it was known as the SLC project, or sporty looking car, which is indeed poetry of the mind. And after development work began in 1985, the SLC project was shown as a prototype, a concept car, at the Tokyo Auto Show in 1989. And production began in earnest in 1990. Now with its flared arches and its swooping curving lines and wraparound rear window, it may look exotic and fancy, but it has more humble underpinnings. It's based on a Hyundai XL, which is a saloon car I admit I've never driven. But if it's anything like this on the road, I imagine it's quite comfortable and quite a pleasant place to be. Now Hyundai were and indeed are a force to be reckoned with in the motoring world. When in the 1970s they wanted to create their own in-house design rather than licensing someone else's, they basically poached designers and engineers from the best companies around the world in order to do it. And when they developed this car in the uh, mid 80s, they spent 521 billion won. And I have genuinely no clue if that's a lot or not. But I imagine it's quite a sizable sum. Throughout the car's life, it had a 1.5 litre four cylinder engine, but not just one engine, two. First of all, it was the Mitsubishi Sirius or Orion engine, which we find also in the Proton. It's a well, well liked, well established, tough as old boots, really can't go wrong motor. So it was a safe choice. That's a 1468cc power unit making a grand total of 81 horsepower. However, in 1993, this was updated with what was Hyundai's first ever in-house designed four-cylinder petrol engine. This is known as the Alpha, which I guess also means first if you think about it. So don't go around thinking it's got an Alfa Romeo engine. It's a Hyundai motor, just the first Hyundai motor. It's also a 1.5, but this time a 1492cc and a tiny bit more power and torque. It's 92 horsepower now, and Newton meters have gone up from 123 to 132. There was also a turbo version, which was significantly more rapid. That jumped up to 115 horsepower and 167 Newton meters of torque, which is quite a jump. Sadly, this isn't one, but it'd be lovely if it was. All those cars are also available with a five-speed manual. This one though has got the four-speed automatic which has got a normal and eco button on it and an overdrive apparently. I'm not quite sure how you engage that. 
So this was an enormously significant car for Hyundai. So between 1990 and 1995, this was their sporty, desirable offering. It was replaced with the Hyundai Coupe. They dropped the S at that point, and that ran on for three more generations, known as the Toburon in America. I even had a Generation 2, which is a slightly wonky looking one. Um, the Mark 1 was really very pretty indeed. The Mark 2 was is interesting. It was, it was an acquired taste, but it really did grow on you. But they had a lot of the same characteristics of this, a nice, comfortable drive, not overtly sporting, but certainly very comfortable, and a feeling of real solidity and quality build, if not desirable, nice plastics. But a great, great quality of build. This has only got 24,000 miles on it and it feels incredible. Let's pull over and take a look around the outside and the interior. So looking around the outside of the car, it really is a fascinating mix of the avant-garde and the ordinary. First of all, I don't know if you're getting the full effect of this color on camera. I'm not sure the video does it justice. It's a deep metallic plum which flips to a light purple. The gold fleckle in the paint is absolutely glorious. And when you see it for the first time, it looks like a concept car that's been put on sale. So that's pretty exciting. It's also got these amazing fender flares, these boxed wheel arches, which make the thing look really quite exciting and sporty and aggressive far more than it really is under the skin. Around the front though, these lights have been lifted straight from a Mark 1 Mondeo, haven't they? Obviously they're not actually Mark 1 Mondeo parts, you don't need to write that in the comments, but looking at this grill area and light area in isolation, ignore that little Hyundai logo and you could imagine for a second you are looking at a Mark 1 Mondeo, which incidentally did also have an astonishingly nice metallic plum colour on it. Moving back, we've got these wheel covers. They're not alloy wheels, they're actually hubcaps, but they give the effect of a three-spoke alloy, which is a thing that only really worked in the late 80s and early 90s. Then we have this plastic body cladding down the side of the cars, which gives it yet more of a sporty appearance, but because it sticks out so far, it has to be recessed on the front of the door so that it can open wide enough to actually open. And we have the MV injection logo on the side and on the boot, because fuel injection was still quite an exciting thing at this time. Rolling back, there's a few more bits and pieces. Then we've got body colored wing mirrors, still an exciting optional extra at the time, an expensive optional extra. And this aerial is hilarious, like on a Honda. And so therefore on Rover 200s of the era, they had the aerial putting up here on the roof. And because it's going down into the A post, it's at a really funny angle on the roof so it can get down this post. Fascinating stuff. It looks like it should be a pillarless door, but it's not. It's just got black area here and wrapping around into the roof. This is a new gutterless style, which was all the rage in the 90s. And this wrap around wraps around into the black. The black tinted window, the black tinted rear window, give it this full floating roof effect, which is really quite exciting, very cool. Looks amazing. And it's very forward thinking, very concept car -y. Again, more boxed arches and a spoiler on the back, giving the whole thing a really interesting, sporty, aggressive look. Well, it was called the sporty looking car after all. Right, let's climb in and take a look around the interior. Now, first of all, you'll notice the fabric that is covering everything is a decidedly not sporty tweed. Very heavy, hard wearing fabric. I mean, it really is the toughest of tough. It does have a properly 90s pattern in this gray twill with the bright red, the bright blue, and a black little slash and a diagonal line all the way across it. And that's a two pattern effect with the solid gray on the sides. And these of course flip forward because it is a coupe. Do like a coupe. Now I'm popping back to the door cards before we climb in. We've got more of the same heavy duty tweedy fabric on the door. Everything feels very solid and very well made. It's a plastic door pull, a plastic door handle, plastic grip here, a little bit of creakage, but honestly, it just feels so robust. It's amazing. We've got electric windows, here in the side, they're very plain and smooth, not much texture to them. I guess that's a budgetary thing. And we have a little door pocket down here in the side. Climbing aboard, we have got our fuel filler cap down there. We've got original Hyundai rubber floor mats. Now again, not very sporty. They do have a beautifully 1980s checker pattern in the rubber, but would look more at home in an off-roader of some kind. The dashboard is really rather cool. First of all, we've got our loudspeakers up here in the top corners of the dashboard rather than in the doors. We have got a fairly acceptable tea shelf. That's a, a good seven and a half out of 10 just there for our tea shelfery. It's not big, but it's very smooth and it is recessed with a lip, so spillages will not land on you. We've got sub 
T-shelf area with cup holding abilities in the glove box lid. All good, but this area here is bigger area, no good for tea storage. So you lose points for that. But yeah, all in all, a good effort. Now, starting over on the far left, we have got adjustable in pretty much every way. Nice big air vents, big glove box. Curiously, only one button on there. Looks like it should be buy button, but it's mono buttoned. So it looks slightly off kilter, but it works and it clicks shut as it should. These are astonishingly well-made cars. Into the large instrument binnacle, which wraps around the driver in a very BMW-like way. So big air vents again for the center passengers. There's an interestingly asymmetrical clock surround just here for the little digital clock. Above our basic ventilation controls, heat, direction, speed, rear fog lights, hazard lights, rear screen heater and some blanks of course to know you could have had some more and then underneath that we've got our Hyundai radio cassette player with auto reverse no less lovely 1990s style radio cassette I adore these things so much underneath that we have oh wow interesting cup holders it's always impressive to see some inventive cup holder action. That little flippy uppy thing gives a little bit more st support for your cups on the move. Bear in mind, this car is early to mid 1990s and they're thinking this thing through. That is very, very ahead of the game. You can see why Hyundai and Kia have literally stormed the markets. Ashtray, 12 volt socket down there. Looks like it's never been used. Again, nice solid action on it. It's not lovely feeling plastic, but it's nice texture to this one, um, but very, very solid indeed. Now moving back to the front, if that makes sense. We've got our dials, fuel gauge and temperature gauge on the outside edge, big sweeping dials for our speed and RPM, redlining at 6,000 RPM, very reminiscent of a Rover R8 slash Honda Civic of the era. In fact, so are the uh, wiper stalks. They've been elongated in an interestingly Korean style, but we do have wipers on the left with a variable intervalometer on the flick wipe and our indicators and lights on the right with an interesting bong. Hidden behind that we've got adjustment for our electric mirrors and a big disc type adjuster and a push button for the boot. And this is electric and it's the only place you'll find a way to get into the boot beyond putting the key in the latch. Then we have our steering wheel. It's a rubbery plastic affair. Elephant hide, molded texture, no airbag, too early. Do have a horn though in the centre. Ooh, that's an ambitious pop which is very, very symbolic of the company itself, really. Now, moving down into the center, we only missed this brightness adjustment for the instruments, and that is a lovely action on that. If that was on a proper premium hi-fi, that would feel really nice. Moving down, finally, to the gearbox. Now, there are two gearbox options on this, just regardless of the engine you chose. You either got the five-speed manual, which is really good, or you got the four-speed automatic which is here. And uh, you have two choices on here. You've got overdrive on and overdrive off, presumably on this button just here. And you have economy and normal. I'm gonna go for normal because economy driving on an automatic is just miserable. Regular top handbrake because of its 1990s and a little cubby hole thing, which is almost the right size for cassettes, but not quite. In terms of headroom, we're doing well. It's a nice bit of space. It's not a lot of room, but you don't feel in any way enclosed because of a nice big glass area all around us. Rear seat space, considering it's a coupe, is surprisingly generous, but this is built on a four-door saloon platform, so no big surprises there. But not a lot of equipment. We've got more of that special 90s fabric on the seats, on the door sides. We don't have opening windows and we don't have loudspeakers, so it's not terribly exciting back there for rear seat passengers. Let's have a quick look in the boot. Now I've pushed the button on the dashboard to open it and let's take a couple of moments to appreciate things on the back of the car. First of all, a high level brake light, very ahead of the game. The original dealer plates from Hyundai Haddock's with an 0206 number. So the phones hadn't even gone to 01 at this point, which shows how old these number plates are. Incredible stuff. We do have interestingly nice wraparound tail lights though. Very modern, very 90s. Now boot space, considering this is a coupe, is really rather generous. It's not far from my Rover 200 coupe, I would say. And uh, also similar in the fact that being a coupe with a, a notch back rather than a lift back, we don't have great access. So things have to go in at a funny angle, a little bit awkward to use. Underneath there, we do have an original spare wheel. Oops. We have an original spare wheel, a jack wheel well. This looks like it's never seen the light of day. In 
terms of on-road manners, it's very comfortable. It's not too hard sprung, so it's more built for comfort like a GT rather than out and out sportiness. Imagine a comfortable, well-equipped Korean saloon car and then lose the back doors and you're, you're basically there. It does trade heavily on its looks rather than its uh, sporting prowess, but the ride is nice. It's really, really comfortable. This is a pretty awful road in places and it's just nice to just cruise down it floating down actually. The primary ride, which is how it deals with big bumps and undulations, is very controlled and the secondary ride, is how it deals with ripples and bumps, is also good as well. I would say this actually handles the road better than my recent model Mercedes. The steering is very light and very fluid, it's nice. Just enough feedback from the wheel and just enough weight as well. Being an 82 horsepower automatic is not blisteringly fast but it is rapid enough to keep you out of trouble, certainly. And the brakes, with discs on the front and drums on the rear, are more than sharp enough for a car as light as this. Must keep remembering though, the indicators are on the right. You do have an incredible glass house. This is a thing of the 90s. The cars had so much space all around them. Thin A pillars, thin B pillars. So incredible view all around. It's just a nice place to be really. But the thing that strikes me most about this car is the rarity. I mean, these were not enormous sellers back in the, uh, in the 90s. I remember when they first came out, seeing like a spy shot kind of thing on the front cover of Auto Express. It may even been a rendering. But I never saw one in real life. And in the intervening 27 years, I've never seen one of these on the road. This is an amazing experience to be at the wheel of one. So this may not have made an enormous splash at the time, not the sales hit the paps they wanted, it's certainly in this country, back home it was enormous in Korea. Around the rest of the world, it was a bit more of a ripple, however, it was a sign of things to come, because in the intervening years, every generation, Hyundai developed and learnt and got better and better and better, and now Hyundai and Kia are making some of the best well-rounded ranges of cars and hot hatches on the market and it all comes back down to this. Do you know what, driving this car really does give me the same kind of feeling and experience as driving my Mark II Hyundai Coupe, which I think was a 2001 car. It feels so similar in so many ways. Great visibility, comfortable, nice handling, not massively rapid. I mean, the, the turbo version of this thing, 0 to 60 in nine seconds, this is a little bit down on that being the automatic naturally aspirated. Hardly any rattles and a feeling of a car that's just dependable and will go on and on and on and on. I really wish I hadn't sold that coupe. That was a good car, should have kept it. That's interesting, you get up to a couple of miles an hour faster and it does feel very, very stable on the road. What a nice car to be in. It's interesting how it has the coupe looks but being built on a saloon underpinnings, it's never gonna set the world on fire but it's a nice place to be. And if you want to go a long way, it's a great travelling companion. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in what is one of the rarest cars on the roads in the UK. There can barely be a handful. I've not done a check, but I'd be amazed if they've made it to double figures even. If you've enjoyed, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.